We welcome all of you this morning and all of you who are worshiping with us online. As we begin our service this morning, uh, we will start with the hymn, Christ has made the sure foundation, 298 in our hymnals here. Those who are able, I invite you to stand as we sing. so that we may be filled with your peace, with your joy, so that we may find the guidance, the strength, and the direction that we need, Lord, to be productive disciples. And Lord Jesus, as 
We worship this morning. We pray that you would help us to truly focus ourselves on your presence among us and on the word that you have to give to each one. That, Lord, we may receive that word and that we may receive your presence with open hearts and spirits. That we may truly learn and grow in this time together and go forth convicted of the call upon each of our hearts to share and to testify to your great salvation, to the love of our Heavenly Father, that others, Lord, may come to you and may experience this great gift themselves. Lord, we are mindful of the great need all around us and in our community and throughout the world. And so we just pray, Father, that you would help us to remain attentive to where you are directing your people to engage, to share, to show compassion and mercy, to, to lift up those, Lord, who most need our help, and to do so in ways that glorify you and not ourselves. And we pray for those who are suffering, those dealing with illnesses for whom we pray your healing. We pray for those, Lord, who grieve this morning, that through the powerful presence of your loving Holy Spirit, they would find comfort and the strength that they need to move forward and to regain their joy. And Lord, we just continue to pray your guidance upon us as one congregation of your great church, that you would give us visions for ministry, that you would continue, Lord, to work through us, touching the lives of others in this community so that we remain a vital congregation of yours. Be with us now, receive from us our thanksgiving and praise as you have forgiven us of our sins and as you have blessed us so many times over, Lord, and so richly. And so we lift before you now our voices in one prayer together that our Lord taught us to pray as we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is I Love to Tell the Story, 149 in our hymns here. Again, I invite you to stand if you're able as we sing. Love to tell. 
bless the Lord, O my soul. And all and that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget and not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good as long as you live. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice. For all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses. His acts to the people of Israel. Amen. Please be seated. If the ushers will come forward at this time, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. Gracious Father, thank you again for the many, many ways in which you so richly bless us each and every day. And as we come now bearing our tithes and our gifts, may we give as freely and joyfully as we have received from you, that the work of your church may continue through this congregation, in this community, and throughout the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may clearly be seen, that they have been done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise Praise God. God. Please be seated. And Nicodemus took some great risks in coming to see Jesus. He risked certainly his reputation and his career, but he also very truly risked his life. See, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and it was his own peers who were trying to discredit and destroy Jesus. Yet here is Nicodemus coming to learn and to be taught by Jesus himself. The fact that he comes in the dark of the night shows us that he knew the risks he was running. But for Nicodemus, this was bigger than, than the risks. He needed to talk to Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus face to face and, and to ask him questions and to learn from him. He acknowledged right off the bat, we know. Even the other Pharisees knew that Jesus had been sent from God because of the the wonders and the miracles that Jesus was performing. And he needed to know more. Now, I mentioned Jesus uh, taught Nicodemus and, and the risk that Nicodemus ran by coming to, to receive these teachings. And, and I mentioned the fact that he even risked his life, but more than just the obvious meaning about the Pharisees, you know, wanting to destroy Jesus and Nicodemus risking his actual physical life. He also risked his life in another way. He risked losing his own life's preconceptions and prejudices. In other words, he risked losing his own way of life to embrace a new way of life through the truth of Jesus' gospel. And that's what we all risk and should risk joyfully in coming to encounter Jesus openly and honestly to hear the truth that he offers us. Truth that challenges our old ways of thinking and doing things and that is centered on our own plans instead of on God's plans. We risk a lot coming to see Jesus. We risk losing our pride and our arrogance in order to embrace humility without which Jesus said, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. We risk losing our self-centered world view to instead see everyone as our equal. We risk losing our willingness to let other people do the work of the church while we sit on the sidelines and cheer them on and instead pitch in ourselves with encouragement to help make things successful, to be Christians. We risk losing our hate for our enemies as we learn instead to extend our love and forgiveness to them as God is extending his love and forgiveness to us. We risk losing our sinful apathy toward the homeless and the poor, replacing it instead with genuine compassion that moves us to take action to do something and make a difference. Because when we 
come to Jesus honestly with our hearts, our minds, and our spirits open to what he is saying to us. He always shows us where we need to make changes in our lives so that we can grow in God's grace and become more centered in God's will. For those of us who are over 40 years old, a couple of us in here are over 40 years old, we remember tuning in on Saturdays to hear the great sports announcer Jim McKay say these words, spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's wide world of sports. And it was his voiceover as they were showing clips of different sport activities. And when they get to the agony of defeat, it was of a skier coming down that steep jump, getting ready to make a ski jump, and all of a sudden everything goes wrong. And he goes tumbling off the side, his goggles fly off one way, his helmet goes another way, his skis are off of his feet, and it represents the agony of defeat. And the skier's name was Vinko Bogatash. He was representing Yugoslavia in that uh, worldwide event on that day in Germany on the mountain. And this fall changed things for Vinko. He would come back and, and all he wound up with was a concussion. And he would come back and, and try to ski the next year, but then he would, he would give it up and go back home, take a job as a forklift driver, and then take up something to do in his spare time. And he decided to try painting. Now the best Vinto ever did, ever placed in his ski jumping career was 57 the day before the big accident. He did, however, train Yugoslavia's world champion ski jumper later on. But what he discovered in painting was his true gift, and he became an international sensation, a world famous painter. Because of that moment of defeat, you know, change is necessary for us as Christians. And sometimes we can become so enamored with our own sinful and selfish lifestyles, we fail to recognize that we need a change. That we need to find a new path. And change isn't always easy. But as Christians, it's necessary. When we refuse to change our old habits, our old ideas, our old attitudes, then what we're truly doing is refusing to grow and we become stagnant. Have you ever seen a, a stagnant pond? It happens when there's no fresh water entering that pond to replace the old and to keep it stirred up. And so the, the pond becomes still and the surface of the water becomes covered with algae and, and scum that blocks the sunlight from reaching the plants below that provide the oxygen in the water. And if nothing happens to change that, then everything begins to die. And what you wind up with is an algae infested breeding ground for mosquitoes and, and biting flies. And our lives as Christians become stagnant if we quench the Holy Spirit as he strives to move within us and to move through us. And we slowly begin to die spiritually. Our prayer life begins to take second place to other things that we think are more important or more interesting or more fun. We stop spending time in the scriptures of the New Testament and no longer hear the challenge and call of the Holy Spirit to grow and to continue in the process of salvation. We become unable to lead others to Christ because we no longer know the way ourselves. In this passage of scripture this morning, Jesus promises Nicodemus that if he is born anew spiritually, he will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And he goes on then to share with Nicodemus the great love that God has for all of the world. Not just the Jewish nation and not just the Jewish religious leaders who really believed they were the only really righteous people, the only ones who were truly right with God and had God's favor. But he also showed Nicodemus that God had not sent him for the purpose of judgment as they all expected the Messiah would come to do. Instead, Jesus tells Nicodemus that God had sent him in order to save the world. And that is the good news, which is the gospel, Jesus Christ. That is the truth that sustains us as God's people, that justifies our hope. It's the truth that sets us free from the guilt of our sins and allows us to experience real peace and joy in our lives. But to receive this truth in our lives, we must change our beliefs in order to embrace what Christ has brought us and taught us and is still striving to teach us. And we must believe, truly believe, that God does really love us and will only do what is best for all we who commit ourselves to him. Because if we truly believe that, we would never hold anything back from God. If we truly understood the love that God had for us, the blessings that God wants to give us, we wouldn't hold any of ourselves back. We would give everything to him. We would commit every day and every moment to seeking his will and whatever we were doing. We would never lose our focus. We must believe that Jesus died for us because we are sinners. And that not any one of us is better than another. We're all equals in, in God's eyes so that we can learn to love and respect everyone around. We need to believe that the way we treat others is what really matters in this life. Not the name you make for yourself, not fame, not what you earn or what you own, but how you treat other people. We must believe that all of these things are predicated upon us taking this truth that Jesus has given us in his gospel and living it out and giving it out. That's how this process of disciple making takes place. When we share these truths with others through our witness, through our testimony. Listen, church, it, it only works if we're vulnerable enough to share with others our own salvation story. To confess to them our sinfulness and Jesus' power to forgive us and to restore us to a full loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. So that we can show and convince them that God loves them just as much. And that God wants to cleanse, to heal, to forgive, and to restore them. We have to share that word of salvation, of love, and of hope with others. Because if all we ever do is take in and never give out, then that word dies within us and we become that stagnant pond. The promises of God are fulfilled to this world through the faithful action of his church. And that's you. It begins with witnessing, with testifying, with forgiveness. It continues and grows through acts of faithfulness and love as we extend mercy and grace as faithful disciples. And as good stewards of God's wonderful blessings and grace and spiritual gifts, we share those with those around us. We need to learn that in this building is not where mission takes place. In this building is not where the world is saved or lost. In this building we, we hear sermons filled with the teachings of Jesus and with exhortations to righteousness and holy living. In this building, we celebrate worship together. We sing our songs of love and praise to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
In this building, we make sacred vows of faith and commitment to one another and to God, to our children as we bring them to baptism, to our spouses as we are wed. But listen, church, life does not happen in this building. Our deeds of love and faithfulness by which we will be judged and rewarded are not accomplished within these walls. Our Christian work and witness are not carried out in this space. This is where our corporate songs of praise are sung to God, but this is not where our life song is sung. That happens when we go outside these walls. That's where mission happens. That's where Christian work happens. That's where we make disciples. That's where we testify and share. That is where we build the kingdom. Many years ago, there was a boy whose name was Paul. Uh, this was a long time ago. Paul lived in the Pacific Northwest and he was a very little boy when his family became the proud owners of one of the first telephones in that neighborhood. It was one of the old wooden boxes, you know, that attached to the wall with the shiny little receiver hung behind, beside it and the, the mouthpiece on the front of the box. None of y'all are old enough to remember this, okay? But young Paul would listen with fascination as his mom and his dad would use that telephone from time to time. And Paul discovered that somewhere inside that wonderful little device lived an amazing person. And her name was Information, Please. And there was nothing she didn't know. Information, Please could supply anybody's phone number who had a telephone at that time and even tell you the correct time of day so you could set your watch. Paul's first experience with information, please, came one day when he was home alone, about six years old, and he whacked his finger playing with his father's hammer. The pain was terrible and Paul didn't know what to do. And as he was running through the house, he saw the telephone and he stopped and he drug a stool up and climbed up on there and he picked up that receiver and he said, information, please. And there were a couple of clicks and this clear, calm voice came on the phone and said, information. I hurt my finger. He wailed into the phone. Isn't anybody home? No, just me. It really hurts. Are you bleeding? No. I hit my hammer with my, my finger with a hammer though, and, and it hurts so bad. And she said, Can you reach your ice box? Well, yes. Go get a piece of ice and hold it to your finger. And he did. And it helped. And after that, Paul called information, please, for everything. <laughs> she helped him with his geography and his math. She taught him how to spell the word fix, told him what to feed his pet chipmunk. And when Paul's canary died, he poured his grief out to information, please, how much he missed hearing that canary sing. And she told him, Paul, always remember that there are other worlds to sing in. And somehow that made sense to his little mind, and he felt much better. A couple of years later, when Paul was nine years old, his family moved to Boston, and everything changed. And he really missed information, please. Many years later, as he was on his way to go and begin college, he was on a plane, and it landed in Seattle. And he thought about his old hometown operator and he called the operator and said, information please. And miraculously, he heard that same small, clear voice say, information. Well, he hadn't really expected to her to still be there and, and not knowing what to do, he just blurted out, can you tell me how to spell fix? And there was a long pause and she said, 
I suppose your finger's all healed by now. And Paul laughed and felt his heart warming. He said, so it really is you. You're still there. Do you have any idea how much you meant to me during that time when I was growing up? I wonder, she said, if you knew how much your cause meant to me. I was never able to have children, and I so used to look forward to your cause. Paul told her how he missed her during the years and asked if he could call again if next time he was in that area. She said, please do. She said, and just ask for Sally. Well, quite some time later, Paul found himself back in Seattle, and true to his word, he called his hometown operator. This time, a different woman answered, and he asked to speak to Sally. And she said, are you a friend? And he said, yes, a very old friend. Just tell her it's Paul. And she said, well, I'm sorry to tell you this. Sally had to cut uh, way back and only work part-time for a while and uh, because she was very sick and she has passed away. And Paul said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. But before he could hang up, the operator said, wait a minute, did you say your name was Paul? And he said, yes. And she said, hang on, Sally left a note for you. And she found the note and she said, here's what it says. When Paul calls, tell him to remember, I still say, that there are other worlds to sing in. He'll know what I mean. And Paul thanked the operator and hung up, and he did truly know what Sally meant. There are other worlds to sing in. Isn't that a beautiful and a powerful thought? And that's what the third chapter of John is all about. There are other worlds to sing in in this life. And beyond this life, when Jesus said to Nicodemus that night, you must be born again. You must be born from above. What he was saying is you don't have to stay the way you are. You must change. You need to make a new start. You can have a new life. You can become a new person. You can change your song and you can sing it in different worlds. And that's exactly what happened to Nicodemus. This encounter with Jesus that night brought a revelation of truth to him that led to spiritual renewal and a new understanding of what a godly life really should be. Nicodemus became a disciple of Jesus in that moment. And later on in the seventh chapter, in the 51st verse, we hear him stand up for Jesus and defend him in front of the Sanhedrin. And later on in John 19, 39, he shares that Nicodemus came with Joseph of Arimathea and helped take Jesus' body down from the cross. And Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes to place with Jesus' body in the burial clothes. That encounter with Jesus changed Nicodemus' life. And an encounter with Jesus will change your life too. Trust him. And go sing your song in other worlds beyond these walls. Go out and share the gospel with those who are lost. Share the bounty that God has blessed you with with those who are in need. And pour yourself out in service to others. So that Christ can keep filling you fresh with his blessings and with his presence. Go sing your life's song beyond these walls. And there will come a time when you will find you are singing in a new world and a new place. Our closing hymn is Sing with All the Sons of Glory, 440. God has promised. 
Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 